colleagues, it's wonderful to welcome you to another session of our Gecko Pathology Meetings, um, a collaboration between uh, the Gastro Foundation and uh, Project Echo. Uh, Cheryl informs me that we have had 90 um, registrations and uh, I'm hoping that uh, more people will be able to join online uh, as we progress with the meeting. We have had registrations as usual from all countries uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa and even um, one registration uh, from the United Kingdom. Welcome to all of you who've been part of this uh, path uh, and those of you who are newbies uh, in this journey. Today we've uh, scrambled up the, the program a little bit. So we're going to first have two case presentations. Each case presentations uh, will be followed by uh, anatomy uh, slides from Professor Martin Hale who we are very lucky to have. He's our resident pathologist. Um, and then after that, uh, Prof Hale is going to give a quick uh, overview of uh, liver tumors. So the first pre pre presenter is uh, Denen Pabu. He's a gastroenterologist. Uh, he's based in Johannesburg at the Donald Gordon uh, Center. And he's going to do a case presentation on an unexpected uh, liver lesion. Uh, Denen, if you're ready, uh, up to you. Uh, please uh, share your slides. Thank you, Prof. Um, hi, my name is Dinan, and um, today I'll be talking to you on an unexpected liver lesion. Um, my case uh, is a Mr. N.A. who was referred to our practice in December 2020. Um, he's got a background history of type 2 diabetes mellitus for more than 10 years. He's been well controlled on oral agents. He's also been hypertensive for that duration. Um, his significant social history, he was a 12.5 pack year smoker. He has had occasional alcohol use less than two units a week, but had completely stopped since 2019 and has no history of recreational drugs, no herbal medication or other over-the-counter medication. He, um, Pertinent family history. His mum had demised at age 57. He thought um, she had a diagnosis of cirrhosis, but was not sure. And um, of his current history, he was seen by a colleague at a referral hospital, was diagnosed with NASH cirrhosis, complicated by portal vein thrombosis, with significant portal hypertension in the form of varices, splenomegaly, and ascites. And this was based on a CT scan done at the end of 2020. In terms of his blood workup on arrival to us, pertinent features including a ALP of 921, GGT of 824, an AST of 53, and ALT of 125. His albumin was 28. Um, his INR was 1.4, and uh, he had mild renal dysfunction on arrival. The rest of his liver workup was unremarkable. Initially, a ultrasound of his abdomen was done, which was just confirmed what we had suspected, a irregular cirrhotic looking liver um, with significant portal hypertension, splenomegaly at 15.6 centimeters, lots of ascites, and basically what we were expecting. However, on endoscopy, um, firstly, the gastroscopy showed five columns of large varices, which were con had concerning features and therefore were banded with good effect. He also had a portal hypertensive gastropathy. Unfortunately, on his colonoscopy, he had the circumferential mass about seven centimeters in length with areas of ulceration in his ascending colon. At this point, we decided to do a staging CT and get the help of our colorectal surgeons. However, this CT showed a hypervascular mass extending through four segments of his liver at least. Um, the scan was reported um, to be a possible advanced stage hepatocellular carcinoma out of transplant even extended criteria with uh, vascular invasion. And at this point, the concern was whether this was a colorectal cancer with a large liver met, or was this a second primary tumor? 
Um, so we biopsied his liver and Prof Hale will take over and take you through the liver biopsy. Thanks, Dana. I don't know if there's any discussion from, uh, from anyone. Shall I just go ahead, Mash? Yes, Prof, I think go ahead. We can have a discussion afterwards. Thank you. Thanks. So I'll just share the screen. Right. So what we um, have here then is a uh, is a liver biopsy. We've got a couple of cores. Can everybody see that? Can that be seen? Yes, probably. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Dylan. So, so this is the biopsy. And um, as, as we go through it, you can see that uh, there is uh, no or minimal um, benign liver tissue. So we've got the normal hepatic parenchyma, which has been completely replaced uh, by the pathology. There is a single small focus of, of uh, liver parenchyma, which is here. You can see that in this region here, small focus of liver tissue. Um, and um, as such as its size that you really can't decide if there's any specific underlying pathology or etiology as far as um, as far as the pathology is concerned. So focusing then on the actual pathology, we've got a bit of a mixed picture here. The first thing that becomes apparent is this extensive fibrosis, as you can see there. And within those areas of fibrosis, you've got these islands of larger cells, and we'll have a, a closer look at them now. They vary considerably in size. They're associated with an inflammatory cell infiltrate. So for example, here you can see uh, significant numbers of neutrophils, and they're also foci of uh, tumor necrosis. And those of you who are histopathologists will recognize that this is a trabecular growth pattern. You can see that there's significant uh, pleomorphism uh, in these cells as hypochromatism. And the cytoplasm has a bit of a variable appearance. It has, um, has an eosinophilic to amphiphilic appearance, which is characteristic of cells that uh, typically show hepatocytic origin. If we look at uh, this cell here, you can see that there's an int what we call an intranuclear hole or invagination. And that's really just a cytoplasmic uh, invagination. It's a pseudo inclusion. And you can see more here as well. And that's typically found in hepatocellular carcinomas. And uh, other features that you can see, these prominent, almost cherry red uh, nucleoli in many of the cells. So you can see here, for example, the similarity between those cells. And if we go back to that little focus of, of hepatocellular tissue, you can see the similarity once the picture builds. You can see the similarity of those malignant cells that I've just shown you uh, to these cells here. So these cells are completely benign. So as I was saying, we've got these uh, large uh, islands of, of tumor cells and nests of tumor cells. And then every now and then uh, we see foci like this where there is a proliferation of a glandular component. You can see small uh, uh, gland lumens being formed near lumina, a little bit of irregularity. And uh, I think it's fairly easy to pass that over and say, well, that's a little bit of bile ductular proliferation. But there are a couple of things that are a little bit unusual. And the first is that there is um, a bit of variation in nuclear size. You can see that you've got a largest nucleus there and a smaller one there. And I don't think it's really enough to be absolutely certain about the um, behavior of that particular focus. But moving down, you can see areas where it starts to become a little bit more aggressive appearing. 
And for example, in this area here, one sees that you've got these areas of hepatocellular differentiation. And then this tongue of cells, which is coming down here, you can see the nuclear pleomorphism, and you can see them almost anastomosing or morphing, if you like, uh, changing their morphology, a subtle change in their morphology to this anastomosing trabecular framework. And uh, in, the, uh, in the fourth edition of the uh, digestive uh, tumors of the, at least the tumors of the digestive tract, in fact, one of, the, one of the descriptive terms that's used is a sort of an antler-like growth pattern, which I think is, is pretty characteristic, very much like uh, a set of horns. So you can see this uh, gradual transition then from hepatocellular cells to these cells here. You can see the pleomorphism. And then in this area here, you can see a similar change. So if we just, for example, follow it down from here, you can see the hepatocellular tissue, and you can see this migration and this gradual changing of morphology. And you can see how we've got this antler-like growth pattern. And this is starting to look a little bit worrying, but still not 100% sure in my mind if I was looking at this for this first time, whether I would call that benign or malignant. And then similarly here, another area. You can see that these cells have greater nuclear pleomorphism. For example, if we look at this one here, just find it again, I've lost it. So a little bit confusing, but uh, um, this I thought was probably one nucleus. In fact, it's not, it's a multinucleated cell. But certainly you can see that you've got this greater variation in nuclear size. And then we come to this area here where you've got much more of an anastomosing appearance now to the cellular proliferation. And if one looks, for example, here, that could easily be a single cell, a single nucleus, similarly this here and also that there. When one sees this variation in nuclear size, you have to think of what we call a fourfold rule. And that is that you need to see if you can fit one nucleus or four of a small nucleus into one nucleus like that. So if we look around and we say, well, are there any small nuclei here? And I think the answer to that is, not really. They're looking a little bit pleomorphic. So you think to yourself, well, could this be dysplastic? So that's enough then of this particular uh, um, core. And I want to show you this core here. What we have here is a similar situation a complete elimination of the normal architecture, which you can see the same trabeculous, um, these uh, thick trabeculae of, of a malignant hepatocytes, and you can see them gradually changing and becoming duct-like in appearance. Fairly typical appearance, look at this. See all this? And this is very concerning now for cholangiocarcinoma. And you can see, for example, here, the same sort of thing, where it's evolving from the more solid tumor nest there to something that is more duct-like in appearance. And then here, you've got more of this antler-type growth pattern. You can see this anastomosis, these anastomosing trabeculae. And then I'm just going to go back again. Sorry, it's backwards and forwards. So here we are. <clears throat> Look at this nucleus here. 
it's hyperchromatic, it's enlarged with big NC ratios, and then you've got a nucleus there, and you've got a nucleus there. And you have to say to yourself, can I fit four of those into one of those? And I think the answer is yes. So you can fit four of those nuclei into those. And that rule you apply to cholangiocarcinoma and pancreatic adenocarcinoma. And so you can see that replicated, for example, here as well. And you have to do that because if you don't, things such as cholangiocarcinoma and, and, um, and uh, proliferating bile ductules can look so irregular that the growth pattern can mislead you into making a mistaken diagnosis of malignancy. So it's very important to see if you've got this uh, cellular proliferation. So based on that, we made a diagnosis then of a combined hepatocellular uh, carcinoma, uh, cholangiocarcinoma, cholangioadenocarcinoma. So if we now go and look at the retic pattern, and uh, here we've got the reticulum, and for those of us who don't have adequate uh, immunohistochemistry, and in fact, even for those of us that do have adequate immunohistochemistry, there is no replacement for what I call the traditional ordinary histochemistry, not the immunohistochemistry, but the traditional histochemistry. It could tell you an awful lot about what's going on in the tumor. So if you look at this, this is a section of those, that tumor nest, and you can see that there's a complete absence of reticulin. So that on its own tells you, hold your hand to tell you that this is a hepatocellular carcinoma. Unfortunately, it doesn't help about the ductular proliferation. This is the ductular proliferation. So on morphological grounds alone, you would have to make the diagnosis of a combined hepatocellular carcinoma stroke cholangiocellular carcinoma. Now this is glypican 3. And we always say as histopathologists that the tumors don't always read the textbooks. And this is an example of that. So this is glypican 3. And unfortunately, this is completely negative, which is disappointing. And it's always worrying when we get negative stains, when we're absolutely convinced that we're dealing with a particular tumor. So it's important then to do a panel of antibodies. But this is glypican 3 in those paracellular areas, and it is completely negative. But we know that not all HCCs are positive with glypican 3. It's a good marker, but it's by no means an absolute marker. It's much better than HEPAR1, which used to be used in the old days. This, on the other hand, is uh, glutamine synthetase. And glutamine synthetase is another marker, which uh, is uh, uh, found in hepatocellular carcinomas. It's not as specific, but certainly it is found. And here you can see that you've got strong cytoplasmic staining for glutamine synthetase. Now, I think Dylan mentioned that the alpha feeder protein, I think, was, was 1.3, if I remember correctly. So we didn't do alpha feeder protein because usually if the alpha feeder protein levels are low, that is not reflected in the tumor. So it becomes a waste of money and a waste of tissue. But that's glutamine synthetase, and that together with the reticulum pattern confirms the diagnosis. So what about the cholangio component? Well, the cholangio component, and this is where things start to become a little confusing, because if we look at this here, we can see that the hepatocellular component, which is there, is positive, as well as the ductular component. And this is where everybody throws up their hands in horror and says, oh no, you know, what is this? Well, the answer is that hepatocellular carcinoma, in fact, well known, can express CK7. So the message is don't be put off by positive CK7 staining in HCC. I think what is comforting in this particular case is that there is a difference in the staining intensity between the cholangial areas such as this. You can see they're much darker compared to the hepatocellular areas. Now, the other thing that when we looked in the books, you also, if you look in the books, there is an entity called the combined hepatocellular carcinoma, uh, cholangiocellular carcinoma. 
And there are a few varieties, especially if you are looking, and I'll go into that more in the discussion afterwards. Um, but uh, there is an entity called uh, the, um, uh, uh, the 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 um, uh, the cholangia, uh, the hepatocellular uh, combined hepatocellular carcinoma, uh, cholangiocarcinoma, a stem cell subtype. And I'll go into that in more detail later. But uh, what we've got here is CD56 staining. And this is useful because you can see that the ductular component is strongly positive, as you see here. And the hepatocellular component, which you see there, is only focally positive. There are pockets of positivity, for example, over here, some of these hepatocytes are positive, but the overwhelming positive staining is in the ductular component. A CD56 is a good marker of stem cell differentiation. The other one is CKIT or CD117, <clears throat> which you get in gastrointestinal stromal tumors. And you can see here that we've got positive staining in the ductular component. So this is when it builds. You can see this is the ductular component here, and you can see this uh, weak cytoplasmic staining of uh, CD117. There's also a little bit of staining of the hepatocellular component. So this then is a combined um, hepatocellular carcinoma, cholangiocellular carcinoma. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Prof. I must say, I did not expect uh, that diagnosis. Uh, this was clearly not uh, an easy case uh, to resolve. I mean, if one considers the number of stains that it took for you to clearly, you know, define what the pathology is, um, it was clearly unexpected. Before I ask other people to comment, uh, Dinen, as you presented the case, I know the alpha fetoprotein was normal, and I was wondering whether you were satisfied uh, that radiologically, did this look like HCC or not HCC? So I guess what I'm asking is, what was it that led you to biopsy uh, the patient? Um, so, Prof, it was the two things. Um, the large colonic mass is what we actually found first. Um, uh, subsequently, he came out with the history that he had had a colonoscopy in 2010, which showed a tubular villus adenoma with high-grade dysplasia in that region. Um, the histology on this time on about 10 biopsies also had high-grade dysplasia only with no actual focus of um, malignancy per se on the colon biopsies. Um, so the reason we didn't actually do a MR liver was we had a sonar 24 hours before that looked completely normal, no masses in the liver. And the CT was actually a staging CT to evaluate the colon mass. Um, but it was, uh, it did have typical CT features uh, in terms of the hypervascular early wash in, early wash out. So the radiologists were fairly happy to call it the HCC based on the, um, the uh, sorry, just lost the word, uh, but based on the contrast uh, characteristics of the lesion. Um, so that's why, but given the diagnostic dilemma and the negative alpha fetoprotein, that's why we decided to biopsy the liver. Um, because he was discussed with uh, colorectal MDT and the oncologists were at a loss as to what to treat him for. Uh, whether this was a metastatic colorectal adeno or whether this was an HCC of sorts. Okay, so he does not have a colorectal uh, malignancy. Based on your so, biopsies. Nope. Technically, we should go back and biopsy again, but the discussion was that given the decompensated serotic large HCC and the fact that the car is not obstructive, it doesn't have any obstructive symptoms at all, um, the colorectal team decided to leave that given the guarded prognosis of the large liver HCC. I'm just curious, what was the CA-99? Was it elevated? It was 93. 
in a smoker with a 50 yeah. back year odd. Yeah. Sure. He could have gone, I mean, if he hadn't been biopsied, I think it's likely that the diagnosis of cholangiocarcinoma might have not been made. Was there any uh, dilatation of the common bile duct on, uh, on the imaging? No. No. Very complicated case. Um, I wonder if anybody on the call has any comments or any questions uh, about the case, either the clinical perspective um, or from the histology or even the imaging. Uh, I think, um, you know, as Prof says, the tumors don't read textbooks. None of, none, nothing about this case is textbook. <laughs> Can I just make a comment on, on uh, you know, the fact that he was diagnosed as a Nash cirrhotic, and then we find um, the colonic lesion, and just uh, to emphasize that, that potential link uh, between Nash cirrhosis uh, or, or the Nash metabolic phenotype and other malignancies, um, including colonic breast, um, et cetera, that, that we should keep an eye out with our Nash patients. Uh, they do. They do have an increased risk of other um, malignancies. Indeed, yeah. Um, and and Janine, what was the family history? Um, you said something about the family history. Was that colonic or was that uh, um, hepa liver? No, fam family history was mum with possible cirrhosis, but that was in the early, late seventies, and he couldn't give me too much information on that. Right. Um, any other comments? Um, I believe. Yes, please, uh, Wendy. Welcome. Thank you so much. So, I mean, I think just from the presentation with the <clears throat> non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and cirrhosis and portal hypertension, just for any registrars who are on the line, typically they present with portal hypertension and very good synthetic function. So often you underestimate the severity of the underlying liver disease, um, and just comment that you can develop an HCC in the absence of cirrhosis in, in NAFLD as well. So we tend to un underestimate the burden of disease associated with NAFLD. And then really just to ask Prof Hale, in terms of the, with this combined hepatocellular cholangiocarcinoma, is it seen, does it seem to be more common that the cholangiocarcinoma seems to arise intrahepatically rather than what we normally see with common bile duct or at the level of the bifurcation? The ones that we've seen, it seemed to be more intrahepatic in origin. Yeah, hi, Wendy. Yes, in fact, the term uh, um, combined paracellular carcinomas, um, cholangiocarcinoma, is reserved for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas. So the, um, the, the large duct cholangiocarcinoma doesn't form part of the spectrum. And in fact, that's a very important point to, that you've raised because the treatment is different. So, so you're really looking at the stem cells evolving both into yeah. from a malignant potential, both into hepatocytes and cholangiocytes. Exactly. In fact, that's what I'll be sort of yeah. briefly discussing yeah. um, at, at the end. But you, you've, you've hit the nail on the head. It's a, basically a pluripotential type of uh, situation. Thanks. Uh, Prof. Hale, I was just wondering, knowing what you know now, in a resource-limited setting, uh, if you had to choose of the stains that you did all together, um, which two would you have done if those were the only two that uh, you had access to, to come at this diagnosis? So, so the first and vital stain is the, is the reticulin. You must always have a really good uh, reticulin stain because that is so useful. Because you see, I think that that was one of the other, um, you know, the other dilemmas that, uh, that we had. As, uh, as Dylan pointed out, we knew he had a, um, had a, a tubular bullous adenoma with high grade dysplasia. We know that he's had that for some years, but we did not, um, we were not able to demonstrate invasion. So uh, what, Dylan, uh, what Dylan didn't mention was that this was a large mass in the colon. And uh, it, I think Dylan was, 75% of the circumference. So it was, it was a big mass. And the problem is that the biopsies may not be representative. Yeah. Um, so you could be missing a focus of invasion somewhere else. So a retic then in, in, a, in a metastatic adenocarcinoma 
would not look like the retic that I'm just showing you for the HCC. There you would see the nice packeting of the cells. So a retic is very useful. I never underestimate the power of the retic. If you were to do uh, immunohistochemistry, then I think uh, uh, CK7 um, and um, glycan 3 would be pretty good sort of basic markers to if you're on a limited budget. Glypican 3 specifically, because it is relatively sensitive for and specific for HCCs. So you can help that, that to distinguish from, uh, from other carcinomas. And of course, CK7. But the problem is that there's a lot of overlap. Uh, yeah. And we must always remember that you've got to do panels. Um, another good one would be CK20. Yeah. Masheko? Yeah. Can we ask then and how you manage the patient? I was, yeah, I was going to come to that. So um, after the MDT meeting with the colorectal surgeons and uh, the oncologists, um, with a family discussion, it was chosen that he, he decided that he's going to go for palliative chemotherapy for the liver lesion um, as his outside transplant criteria. And the colorectal surgeons didn't want to go into the abdomen. Unfortunately, the prognosis is such that his six-month um, life expectancy isn't that great at the moment. So he decided to go down the palliative chemotherapy route. Um, Professor Hale, what did the underlying normal uh, liver tissue show? Did it show any evidence of disease, cirrhosis, or so? No, I, I, unfortunately not. There was just that very small focus of um, probably 100 cells, I would think, uh, uh, which was impossible. We couldn't even really, uh, we were unable even to decide whether the background liver was cirrhotic or not. Uh, would you like to speculate on the coincidence and perhaps etiology of the combined hepatocellular carcinoma and uh, uh, bile duct or cholangiocarcinoma in the same liver? Sure. So the, the etiology um, is, is thought to be exactly the same as for um, hepatocellular carcinomas um, and cholangio, intra, intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas, not the extrahepatic ones. But um, this, the same principles would apply of, uh, of um, really any cause of uh, cirrhosis of the liver. Um, and then, of course, specific causes such as hepatitis B, if you're getting integration and, and so on. Um, before we go to the next case, I was just wondering, are there others who've um, seen cases like this? Uh, and what their experience was either with uh, making a firm diagnosis uh, or managing the patient or the patient uh, outcomes. Dinan, I think this is a really uh, interesting case. I mean, Prof. Hale, I don't know how often you see this type of presentation, um, pathologically speaking. So, so, Nash, I think we probably see one, maybe two a year. But I think also we need to recognize that um, that we are a referral center. Um, mm. But certainly, you know, in, in all my years at Barra, we did see them occasionally. Mm. Um, but they are rare. They are very yeah. rare. Yeah. Any other comments uh, before I move on? There's nothing else in the chat box. All right, well, if, if that's it, uh, Dinan, thank you so much uh, for a fascinating case. I mean, I think uh, the outcome for the patient is not fantastic, but I get the sense that uh, had he presented a few months later, all of this may have been missed. Uh, he might have demised prior to it being detected. So, yes. yeah. Great, thank you very much, guys. Awesome. All right, I think we'll move on to our next case presentation. Uh, and that will be done by uh, Bilal Bobat. He's a gastroenterologist, hepatologist based at the Donald Gordon in Johannesburg. And he has cryptically named it a bundle of uh, liver tumors. Uh, Bilal, over to you. Thanks, Prof. Um, thanks to everyone for uh, joining the presentation. Um, 
So can you all see my screen? Uh, let me just check. Uh, yes, well, I just right. put it in presentation. Yeah, so, um, so Mr. JC, uh, a 60 year old uh, school teacher, um, uh, originally, originally from Ireland uh, that has been living in South Africa for many years. Uh, he was referred to uh, me by a physician who had noted multiple liver lesions after uh, a recent hospital admission uh, for a pneumonia. This is back in uh, 2016 that uh, he initially came to me. Um, he was known with, uh, as being hypertensive on a calcium channel blocker, ACE inhibitor, and endapamide. No, no uh, herbal medication, supplements, or traditional medication, and of note, no uh, steroids. He admitted to me of taking approximately 20 units uh, per week on average. And, you know, if you want to be cynical and sitting in a hepatology practice, you might want to double that. Um, because as I'll show you in a second, his, his, his uh, LFT was, was, was looking quite hot. A fa family history was positive of a sister who died of liver disease at age 59. He is uncertain if there was a malignancy, but does report quite a significant ethanol uh, 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 background in, with, with his sister. Um, of note was this MCV of, of 106. Oh, sorry. No, 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 sorry. Please ignore that FBC at, uh, at the top there. For some reason, it's reverted to... Uh, my previous case, uh, so ignore the FBC, um, but he did have uh, a, a mild macrocytosis, not as significant as that, but in keeping with um, a history suggestive of, of, of a bit more ethanol than 20 units per week. Um, his gamma glutamyl transferase was sitting over 1,000 uh, and his AST just over 200. His hepatitis serology was, uh, was negative and uh, rest of his vi viral panel. Of note was a ferritin of 1,195 uh, with a percentage SATs of 67%, a, uh, a, C a C2A2Y um, gene mutation was done and it was noted that it was heterozygous positive. His alpha feta protein uh, was elevated at 90, but please remember that he does have a hepatitis um, uh, that uh, is currently taking place, and we considered that to be a, a possible possible uh, reason. His CA99 was within normal range at that time. IgA mildly elevated. He had a um, he had an MRI done then in September of 2016, which showed numerous lesions with varied signal pattern. Um, and it felt to be most likely due to multiple hepatic adenomas uh, of the inflammatory subtype. Um, the liver itself did look coarse and they did comment on uh, a degree of iron overload. Through the course of the next few months, um, and, and we managed him uh, then from 20, September 2016, uh, over the next two years, his alpha feet protein came down quite nicely and associated with an improvement in his liver, liver function. And, you know, uh, an important point here is that his ferritin also subsided quite dramatically. Um, his ferritin, in fact, came down into the normal range without any phlebotomy. So, you know, and, and, and he subsequently admitted to me when I pointed this out to him that yes, maybe, maybe he was uh, uh, counting only every second drink when he uh, reported his intake to me. As you can see, his alpha feta protein, and this is around through 2017 then, it came down to about 50 before entering into 2018 where there started to be a slight uptick. And in August, 2018, we repeated the MRI and it showed a new lesion in segment eight of 1.3 centimeters. It was still relatively indeterminate at that time. Um, and we followed it up in three months with a repeat uh, MRI, which showed an increase in diameter of 21%, along with an, a, a rising alpha feta protein level. And that had me concerned for hepatocellular carcinoma. As you can see, most of these other adenomas are relatively, relatively stable. So 
60 year old male with alcohol induced cirrhosis and multiple hepatic adenomas. I can't quite call it hepatic adenomatosis because he had less than 10, 10 lesions uh, of the inflammatory subtype. He was under close observation for the development of a, of a hepatocellular carcinoma. And in, at the end of 2018, uh, we felt that that had now occurred and we referred him on for liver transplantation. At the time of transplant, his alpha feta protein uh, had risen to a level of 200. So still suggestive of a, of a positive outcome and still within Milan criteria uh, for, for, his, for his liver transplant. We were all, however, quite surprised to find uh, what we did at the explant histology. And I'm going to pass that on now to Prof Hale. Thank you, Prof. Thanks, thanks, Bilal. Right, um, can everybody see that? Uh, yes, we can, Prof, thank you. Okay, so this was uh, his, um, his liver. And unfortunately, I haven't got a, a, a macro photo, our macro camera, uh, unfortunately, packed up uh, at that particular time. But uh, anyway, what, um, what we have here is, uh, this is a, a pretty standard uh, um, segmental diagram uh, of the liver. And uh, what we've done here is we've mapped out uh, the tumor nodules uh, that and we, cor uh, we correlated this uh, with the scan. We took quite a bit of time to go through the scan. So we have a total of seven nodules really sp uh, spread throughout the liver uh, so from segments two and three, uh, all the way through to uh, the, uh, the left lobe of the liver, where you can see there are numerous, numerous nodules. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the histology uh, of different, uh, different tumors. So I'm going to stop the share, and I'm going to show you a selection of slides. And I'll try and go through them slowly, recognizing that uh, the time is is also um, is also moving on. Right. So this is uh, one of the nodules, and um, what we've got here is uh, is normal hepatic. Well, I shouldn't say normal hepatic parenchyma. Uh, this is uh, cirrhotic uh, uh, hepatic parenchyma. I can show you. Um, uh, other sections uh, later on, but uh, he had cirrhosis and that was uh, secondary to uh, fatty liver disease, probably alcoholic uh, liver disease. But moving on to the tumor then, what we have here is we've got a, a nodule which is partly encapsulated. I think this was just on the, on the um, outside, uh, just beneath Glisson's capsule. And you can see that uh, this is a pretty typical picture of a hepatocellular carcinoma. You've got these broad trabeculae of malignant hepatocytes, uh, as you saw in the first case. You've got this sort of uh, recapitulation of the sinusoidal growth pattern. Uh, we've got tumor necrosis, and we have cells that uh, have those typical features uh, that I showed you earlier on of this sort of amphiphilic to eosinophilic cytoplasm. We've got cells with these prominent cherry red nucleoli. We've got quite a bit of inflammation in, in, this, in this tumor. And uh, the other thing that uh, is also present and um, are, are, the, are the presence of the numerous Mallory Denk bodies. They don't show up particularly well. I'm hoping that in subsequent sections, I'll be able to show you better examples. So that's a fairly standard picture then of hepatocellular carcinoma. And those of you registrars who are writing exams, your part one and part two, maybe it's a bit hard for a, for a part one slide, but certainly this would certainly be, uh, could easily be put into your uh, uh, part two slide box. So um, typical picture then that you see in the pictures of a trabecular paracellular carcinoma. And then we look at the reticulin pattern. Remember I said that the retic is very important. And if we look at the reticulin pattern, you can see that there's the normal retic in the liver. 
So that is what the normal pattern, or should say that's what benign reticulin looks like. I shouldn't say it's normal because this is actually a cirrhotic liver. So you've got a bit of trabecular disarray, but you can still see that you've got retention of the reticulin framework. When we move across to the tumor, you can see that it is completely gone. So there's the capsule there, and you should be able to recognize that straight away and say, yes, this is a hepatocellular carcinoma. Bearing in mind that there was also the uh, possibility of a metastatic adenocarcinoma, particularly in view of the fact that there are multiple lesions, because it is unusual for hepatocellular carcinomas to have multiplicity of lesions. So when you've got seven nodules like this, you do need to be certain that in fact you're dealing with HCC. So that's the reticulin pattern. And then we go to our glycocan 3, and we see that there is positivity with the glycocan 3 in this tumor. Now, also, for those of you who don't see glycocan 3s often, and you may use it and say, yes, this is a good antibody, just a word of caution, you can get focal glycocan 3 positivity in a cirrhotic liver, okay? That's not in this particular case, but when we move to the tumor, we can see that there are isolated cells that show well-established glycocan 3 positivity. You can see, for example, that there. So that's, uh, that holds our hand then as far as the, um, as far as the uh, um, hepatocellular origin is concerned. This then is CK7. And uh, the CK7, uh, you can see that you've got the ductular proliferation. That's benign ductular proliferation at the edge. You can see that you've got a bit of stem cell metaplasia in the hepatocytes uh, at the periphery here. And then in the actual tumor itself, uh, in this particular slide, there is no positivity. So this, this CK7 is negative. Bearing in mind the multiplicity of lesions and the fact that, in fact, there is a, an isolated cell that is CK7, but as I mentioned earlier, HCCs can show positivity. Then we decided to do a CDX2 just to make sure that this wasn't a metastatic colorectal carcinoma. And lo and behold, it is positive. And here you can see good gain positivity for CDX2. But uh, once again, bear in mind that uh, hepatocellular carcinomas can be CDX2 positive. So we don't just need to park that. Here's another nodule, same patient. And in this particular case, so uh, just remember if I can ask you just to take in your minds a photographic picture and park that away in your occipital cortex of what a classic hepatocellular carcinoma looks like. Okay, so when we go to, because we've got another half a dozen slides to look at. So that's what a typical HCC looks like. So we go to another nodule, and lo and behold, what do we find? We find something completely different. And here, we've got a tumor which is now growing in a glandular pattern. And this throws us again. So what could this be? Could this be metastatic? Could it be cellular carcinoma? Could it be combined cellular carcinoma, hepatocellular carcinoma? And every now and then, we get this focus of cells such as that there that have an HCC type of picture, very similar to what we've seen already. But this here, there's another focus of HCC, but this here is quite different. Although, having said that, you can see a focus here that looks a bit like hepatocellular carcinoma, and here, an area that is glandular. And remember that you can also get pseudoglandular hepatocellular carcinomas just to add into the mix. So when we do the immunohistochemistry, we find that the CK7 is strongly positive. So this is the CK7, really strongly positive. There's no doubt whatsoever about the cytoplasmic staining of that CK7. And then when we look at the glycocan 3, we see that that is also positive. 
and this is what Prof Spearman was asking earlier on as well, the plasticity or the uh, multi uh, pluripotential nature of hepatocellular carcinoma. And there you can see uh, quite clearly uh, good staining with, with, um, with glypican 3. Then we move to another nodule. Remember that HCC that you packed away in your occipital cortex? So this is the normal liver or the cirrhotic liver. At uh, here you can see uh, we've got um, a portal tract and uh, we can see that uh, we've got quite extensive steatosis. There were first signs of uh, steatohepatitis as well. And I'm quite happy that these features are consistent with, um, uh, with uh, alcoholic steatohepatitis or, and probably combined with non-alcoholic steatohepatitis as well. But then when we move to the tumor nodule, we see this. And here is another variant. And here you've got a tumor that looks as though it's been taken from a lipoma in the subcutaneous fat. But here you get this extensive steatosis. And that's another variant of hepatocellular carcinoma. In addition, we've also got this pigment here, and this is actually bile. So that tells you that this is HCC. And remember that hepatocellular carcinomas can produce bile, and you should always look for it. And it's particularly rewarding if you find it in metastatic lesions, for example, in the subcutaneous tissue uh, uh, in the scalp, I can remember a few patients with, with metastatic HCCs, and we've diagnosed those purely on the identification of intracytoplasmic bile. So this is a good example then of, uh, of another variant of hepatocellular carcinoma. And we go to another one, another nodule. These are all different nodules. And in this one here, once again, Lots and lots of fat. You can see that there are foci of steatohepatitis. And the reason I chose this one is because here you've got malary denk bodies. And you could find malary denk bodies in hepatocellular carcinomas. So you've got this, this small droplet appearance. For example, there are, are some cells showing this these small droplets of, of fat, and then you have other cells showing you this large droplet component. So it's absolutely classical. And then when we go to the reticulum framework, there's the cirrhotic picture there. Sorry, wrong, wrong slide. That was the control. There's the cirrhotic picture there, the cirrhotic nodules. And then this is the HCC. So once again, you have a look at the normal, or the retention, I should say, of the, retic of the reticulum framework there. You've got the lobular disarray because it's cirrhotic. And then there's the capsule or the pseudo capsule, and there's the tumor. And you can see, for example, if I just put this in the middle, I think one can see, for example, on the right-hand side, the benign reticulum framework, and here, this fragmented, uh, partially disappeared reticulum framework of the paracellular carcinoma. And then the last slide, just to show you another area, another nodule, this was in segment seven, if I remember correctly. And to show you, there's the native liver there, the cirrhotic liver, a glandular component there, as you can see, pretty characteristic. And you can see it uh, undergoing a uh, sort of morphogenetic change where you've got glandular areas merging with hepatocellular areas. And then this is the glycocarin 3.
and the glycan 3 is negative. So those are some of those areas there, which are negative with glycan 3. This is a CK7. You can see that the CK7 is strongly positive there. And then just to add a little bit more confusion, if it's not confusing enough, this is CK20, which is also positive. So this is another example then of Hepatocellular combined, hepatocellular carcinoma, uh, and uh, intrahepatic cholangiocellular carcinoma. So it's basically an another variation of uh, what we saw earlier on. And what I'm going to do now is just quickly go through um, my little bit of a presentation that I've got here. And can everybody see that? Yes, brother. Great. Okay, so what we have then, then what is the definition? So the definition is the unequivocal presence of both hepatocytic and cholangiocytic differentiation within the same tumor. And important is the collision tumors are not part of this entity. And we call them combined, that's what C means, hepatocellular carcinoma, cholangio, uh, um, a cholangiocellular adenocarcinoma, that's what CCA stands for. They're rare tumors, and uh, as I said earlier, they comprise um, only 2 to 5 percent of primary liver cell cancers. Their pathogenesis remains unclear, but what I've demonstrated is the uh, thoughts are that there is transdifferentiation or plasticity of hepatocellular carcinomas. And in fact, what has been established in some patients is that uh, you get these combined tumors sometimes after taste therapy. And for those of you who don't know the registrars, uh, taste is transarterial chemoembolization. You can also get a radioembolization as well. And uh, molecular studies have demonstrated basically that there's a, a common clonal origin uh, between hepatocellular carcinomas and uh, eyes intrahepatic. Uh, compared to extrahepatic uh, cholangiocarcinomas. So uh, it looks as though they come from the same cell. The other thing that has also been found is that some of these tumors show mutations uh, which closely resemble those found in HCCs, while others show mutations that more closely resemble uh, intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas. The cells have stem cell progenitor morphology, uh, as I demonstrated in the first case, and evidence of that is the is SAL4. SAL4 is a, a good immunohistochemical marker for germ cell tumors and other stem cell uh, stem cells, and and of course other stem cell markers, as I mentioned to you uh, earlier on. The two components can either be close and to together or intermingled, and in both our instances, both of these patients, uh, they have, they were intermingled. There is currently no cutoff for each component to establish the diagnosis. So if you see any of these changes, uh, that enables you to make the diagnosis. It's important though, the morphology is most important for making the diagnosis. And that does need to be supported by immunohistochemistry. But the critical thing is, and this is particularly for the histopathologists and registrars, is to remember that these markers, as I've shown you, can be positive in both hepatocellular carcinoma and intrahepatic uh, cholangiocellular adenocarcinoma. So I've demonstrated, for example, the HCCs can be CK7 positive and, and so on. The markers of stem cell differentiation, CK19, uh, EPCAM, CD56, I think, which certainly most of us have here in, uh, in South Africa, and of course, CD117, which is pretty universally available in South Africa. That's obviously you known as the kit mutation. CK7, remember, uh, identifies biliary differentiation in general, including stem cells. So the term combined hepatocellular cholangiocarcinoma uh, has, been, uh, has been 
uh, proposed uh, in the fourth edition of the WHO, but in fact, that has actually now been done away with. Uh, but those of you who may be looking at the fourth edition, you will see that that's divided into the classic type uh, and then the types with the uh, stem cell features, which are uh, uh, divided into the typical subtype, the intermediate cell subtype, and the, um, sorry, there's a type over there, the clangiolocellular subtype. But this term of the stem cell subtype, in fact, is no longer recommended in the fifth edition. I briefly want to touch on just the intermediate cell carcinomas of the liver. This is a new entity which is starting to be described. And this describes a tumor in the liver, a primary liver cell carcinoma, whose morphology is intermediate between hepatocytes and cholangiocytes. Importantly, it is homogeneous. In other words, it looks the same all the way through the tumor. And those cells are small cells with uh, scant cytoplasm, typically in a trabecular arrangement. You may get occasional glands, and often there's fi abundant fibrous stroma. And just to remember that the focal presence, because you can get these intermediate cells, I didn't show you those in our particular case, but the focal presence of these cells uh, in the combined hepatocellular uh, cellular adenocarcinoma does not equate to a diagnosis of intermediate cell carcinoma. So you may say, well, why is that important? And that is important because you must not um, overcall a diagnosis of combined hepatocellular carcinoma, cholangiocellular adenocarcinoma, for the reason that if you overcall those particular tumors, you may in fact deprive patients who either have hepatocellular carcinoma or intrahepatic cholangiocellular adenocarcinoma of specific treatment uh, that is directed to those as individual uh, as individual entities. And to remember that the combined tumor has a poorer prognosis when compared to hepatocellular carcinoma. And that's, uh, that's it. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Prof. Um, <laughs> again, um, I, I guess one couldn't have expected uh, to see that pathology, the mixed pathology. Um, Lungilong Gobesa, I've noted your hand and I'll come to you. I was just wondering, uh, Bilal, um, what happened to the patient? Uh, what treatment was he subjected to and how has the patient done? So, you know, with that histology, uh, he's actually out of transplant criteria. And uh, with the HCC uh, Kalanja combined, it, it, uh, as Prof Hale has pointed out, it, uh, it um, gives a poorer prognosis. So we, we, we've been quite worried about him but he has confounded us and I'm seeing him tomorrow in clinic. Uh, he's doing fantastically well. He had a CT done at the end of last week that shows no recurrence. Um, we, were, we were monitoring him three monthly and uh, you know, we're, we're, we're almost at two years out from his transplant. Um, and I am considering saying, let's start downscaling your imaging to six monthly now because he's getting quite a bit of radiation exposure with all those CTs. Um, the alpha feta protein remains flat um, and, and, and he's, he's doing very well. I mean, I presume he did stop alcohol intake altogether and his percentage sets came down as well as the ferritin or that has remained up? Uh, no, uh, his, his uh, percentage sets also normalized. Let me see if I can uh, quickly call it up to give you exactly what it was, but uh, most certainly, it had uh, it had normalized pretty darn quickly. Um, ferritin here of fifty. Uh, I don't have the percent sats. Uh, let's see if I can click on that. Uh, yeah, uh, but it, it it came down beautifully uh, and remained within the normal range. His transaminases similarly, his gamma glutamyl transferase, all of that um, uh, improved beautifully. Yeah. It's an incredible case. Um, I think you should collect them and do a case series um, that is publishable. I, I'm pretty sure. We've got another case, um, yeah. you know, uh, of of this of the, of this variant. A uh, uh, 45 year old gentleman. His mother had uh, uh, cancer at the age of 45. He turned 45 and decided to go for a scan. They found liver lesions, and unfortunately, a seven centimeter tumor with 
multiple satellite lesions that the initial surgeon did a right hip, uh, hepatectomy for. Um, but I'm still, I'm still concerned about this, this chap. He came to me for an opinion. Um, that's the, so that's another one. And that's why we, we, we just suddenly had a spate of these. And we said, maybe let's present, present this as an unusual uh, scenario. Yeah. Thanks, Bilal. Um, Lungila Ngobese, uh, I don't know if you have a comment or a question. Please Hi. Uh, I've got a, a question for Prof Hill. Um, it, it uh, mentions that uh, in the old days, you used to see such cases at Bara, and we still see them uh, now and again, and they can be quite a, a huge problem, especially if you've got small biopsy. So my question for Prof is that in your experience, Prof, how much can a PES and a DPS help in a case where you've got a tumor where you think you've got a component that looks trabecular and you're considering hepatocellular carcinoma, but there's also a definitive um, tubular component where you think this is glandular differentiation. So using a PES and DPS, can it help in the resolution? Uh, Lungili, hi, yes, I, th I think it can. Um, I think if it is diastase positive and shows a bit of mucin, then that would help you suggest that it is, that it is uh, um, showing glandular differentiation. But I think there is a word of caution, and that is that the traditionally glandular cellular carcinomas uh, don't produce much in the way of mucin. Mm. So it's probably better to, to do those, uh, those bowel ducts. Term markers, You're not just confine it to CK7, but for example, to do the to, to do the 56, uh, the 117, and and probably also the Sol4. Uh, just to, I, I think what these cases certainly have taught me is that it's it's not one thing; it's it's a constellation of um, of things that ultimately you draw to a conclusion. Thanks. I'd I'd like to ask, with regard to the norm, normal liver, was there an accumulation of iron in the liver, in the normal looking liver, or was it purely alcoholic? Um, so if, if uh, before you answer, Prof, in terms of your, your stains, but um, you know, one of the MRIs that we did, we actually did a, a, a quantitative iron uh, measurement and that came back as normal, but this was once the liver had settled down after he had um, abstained from alcohol from, from for a period of time. I didn't include that in the clinical presentation, but the iron content in the in the liver was then normal. It used to be obviously a patient who is abusing alcohol should stop alcohol, but it is recognised that some patients who stop alcohol do develop regeneration and of the liver tissue, and that may predispose to hepatocellular carcinoma. Professor Hale, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, certainly as far as this patient was concerned, there was, there was no, no iron uh, in, the, in the original explanted liver. Uh, and as far as, the, as far as the predisposition to HCC, you're absolutely right. It's the regeneration uh, that is taking place that is thought to be the the, the sort of uh, initiating factor uh, that, um, like all cells, as they as they proliferate, so you get increased risk of uh, mutations. Some of which are um, are lethal mutations, and uh, the cirrhotic patients um, that's thought to be the mechanism. Um, I see two questions from Professor Ojo in Nigeria. Uh, Prof, I wonder if uh, you. I think it would be better if you unmuted and put your camera on and perhaps uh, ask your questions. Prof Ojo? I'm not sure if he's having uh, technical issues. Um, Prof uh, Mashi, Mashi is having technical issues. Yeah, he's been messaging me. Uh, Prof Hale, he was asking, is there any recognized relationship between the combined uh, CCA, HCC tumors and hepatitis B? So, so the answer to that um, could, I mean, it could certainly uh, certainly be, not so much that hepatitis B 
is uh, the prime etiological agent, uh, but is the cause of the cirrhosis, um, or of course with Hep B, the integration uh, that uh, gives rise to the um, hepatocellular carcinoma. But I, but I don't think we should say that that hepatitis B is the only cause of combined hepatocellular carcinomas, cholangiocarcinomas. Right. They can they can occur in any causes of cirrhosis. Is, even is even hep B. Even hep B. No, hepatitis C. Even C. Okay. No. His final question is: um, and what's the oncological import of these peculiar tumors? Tumors. Oncological import. I'm not even sure myself what the, what that no, means. So I think. Uh, um, the importance there is to recognize, um, and in fact, I, um, I was asking earlier on if there were any oncologists that maybe participate in this, but uh, there is specific treatment uh, for paracellular carcinomas and specific treatment for cellular carcinomas. So the literature says that it's important to identify the combined tumor a, because they have a worse prognosis, but also because um, the treatment of a unitary hepatocellular carcinoma, uh, I'm not sure unitary is the right word, um, uh, uh, yeah, a, pure, a pure hepatocellular carcinoma or a pure cholangiocellular carcinoma is different. They don't get the same treatment. So if we call them combined lesions, then potentially we are um, um, uh, taking, or at least removing them from potential treatment. Yeah. But I don't know what that treatment is. Right. Well, thank you so much. Um, he does have another question, but I think uh, in the interest of time, uh, Prof. Ojo, I will have to move on. Uh, thank you so much to all three of our presenters. Uh, I think this has been a fascinating afternoon. I mean, we always hear about how heterogeneous HCC is, but I, I don't think I've quite seen it in display uh, as I have uh, this afternoon. I mean, the, the heterogeneity ranges from the clinical presentation, the underlying etiology, molecular mechanisms, genetics, epigenetics, you name it. And I think Prof. Hale has so elegantly uh, shown how these tumors, really one tumor is definitely not the same uh, as the next. Um, so thank you very much uh, for that um, masterclass. Um, I think that was truly wonderful. Um, I wanted to say hello to uh, Catherine Edwards, who joins us routinely from the United Kingdom. Uh, hello, Catherine. Um, if we had time, I would have asked you to make a comment. Um, but thank you so much for joining. Are you there? Hi, there you are. Greetings <laughs> from the UK to everyone. Enjoyed your presentation, Prof Hale. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thanks for joining us. Um, and yeah, so I just want to say thank you once again uh, for the opportunity um, and uh, to thank uh, the University of New Mexico, the Gaston Foundation, the usual suspects, Karen, uh, Cheryl, all the presenters and all the participants. And we really appreciate your participation. We appreciate your interest uh, in these series um, of GECO uh, sessions. And uh, please do come back next week. Next week we have uh, endoscopy. Um, so join us uh, same time, uh, 3.30 uh, 4.30 on a Wednesday afternoon. Thank you so much, I really appreciate it. If you will, please go to the chat and fill in the um, uh, feedback form. And if you have any questions, any suggestions, if you'd like to present a case, please contact uh, Karen Fenton. She's the one that sends out uh, the invites. Thank you so much and have a good evening. Thanks, 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 thanks Mash. Thanks to everyone. Cheers. Thanks, that was awesome. Thanks, Bilal and Jenin. Pleasure. Thank you. Nice guys. Nice guys.